deviation is manifest in the role of political parties, especially the ways and the manners in which they recruit candidates for elective positions, and also the ways and the manners by which they and their selected candidates engage with the electoral process, as well as engage in governance once they get elected. The preponderance of political regimes globally in the 21st century are democratic and are of the variety that is called either representative democracy or liberal democracy. And in 2020, the Economic Intelligence Unit, which annually develops what we call a democracy index, has identified 110 out of, I think, a total of our 196 or so countries uh, in the world, uh, especially members of the United Nations. They have identified 110 countries as democracies or operating democratic regimes. And they have classified these countries into what they call full democracies and there are 20 classified full democracies in the world and then they identified what they call float democracies and there are 52 float democracies classified in the world and they have identified what they call hybrid regimes and these hybrid regimes they are regime for a democratic one. Hybrid regimes combine autocratic features with democratic ones and can simultaneously hold political repressions and regular elections. End of quote. Indeed, the Economic Intelligence Unit that classifies countries into types of democratic regimes also noted, and I quote, that hybrid regimes are nations with regular electoral fraud, so they conduct elections regularly, but the elections are also determined by fraudulent uh, activities, preventing them from being fair and free democracies. These nations commonly have governments that apply pressure on political opposition, have non-independent judiciaries, have widespread corruption, harassment, and pressure placed on the media, have an anemic rule of law, and no pronounced faults than those countries that are classified as flawed democracies. In the, in the ring of undeveloped political culture, low levels of participation in politics, and the issues in the functioning of governments. End of quote. I think it's important that before we look at the Nigerian situation, we also understand the basic tenets of liberal democracy that we have said we have been trying to practice since 1999, since we returned from an long period of authoritarian political group into what we call a transition to democracy. So we chose liberal democracy because that's what we knew under colonial rule, and therefore we felt we could develop using liberal democratic uh, principles. And of course, the only difference or alteration we made was that in 1979, rather than the parliamentary system of liberal democracy, which we practiced under colonial rule, and we decided to move the presidential system uh, similar to, uh, uh, to borrowing a lot from the American uh, democratic uh, tradition. So liberal democratic system 
as certain basic principles and tenets. And if a country aspires to be a full democracy, not a flawed democracy, certainly not a hybrid democracy, then it needs to recognize its basic tenets and it needs to in practice not only invite its basic principles but also act in accordance with these basic tenets and principles. So what are these basic tenets and principles? A scholar of, uh, a very notable scholar of democracy, uh, Larry Diamond, has identified these tenets and he said that liberal democracy must include at least four key elements. One, I quote, a political system for choosing and replacing the government through free and fair elections. Two, the active participation of people as citizens in politics and civil life. Three, protection of human rights of all citizens. And four, a rule of law which the laws and procedures apply equally to all citizens, end of quote. There are many other things you can describe, you know, freedom of expression and so on. They are all basic components of this. Free speech, freedom of religion, and what have you. They are all summarized in the context uh, of this. So, how have we fared as a country that for 21 years has been transiting from authoritarian rule to liberal democratic rule? For people as citizens, to be able to choose and or replace government or more appropriately for their representatives in governance, whether in the legislative or executive branches of government, to freely and fairly choose their representative uh, 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 choose and replace government, both the participants in the electoral process and the public institutions conducting elections must have integrity. So integrity is key in participation in the preparation and conduct of elections. And I think regrettably, this significant issue of participation with integrity, selection of candidates with integrity, and preparation of conduct of elections with integrity have been systematically undermined by our dominant elite while pretending to pilot transition to democracy in our power. And that is a fundamental obstruction of democratic transition that can eventually lead on the trajectory of authoritarian rule to full democratic so I think it's very, very important that we bear this in mind. And in this regard, political parties, which are the special purpose vehicles for interest aggregation, interest articulation, candidate recruitment and selection for electoral contest, and mobilization of citizens as voters in the electoral process, have which, and which need to be well organized and have to function well in accordance with the demo democratic tenets and principles uh, and actually leave much to be desired in the Nigerian context. A key principle of representative democracy, which is well conceptualized in democratic theory, is that the people as citizens are the principles. The government is the agent and the elected representatives are to be their servants who should act in accordance with the needs and the aspirations of the people. And therefore the government in which they represent the people, whether as lawmakers or as 
makers and the implementers of public policies uh, uh, actually have to be guided by the needs and the aspirations of the people. In other words, those whom they have elected should be responsible to the people and should also be responsive to the needs and the aspirations of the people. In their role with regards to leadership recruitment and selection, regrettably, political parties in Nigeria, which are supposed to be guided by one, a person's membership, familiarity with what the party stands for, its core values and orientations, its manifesto, and then the personal commitment and loyalty of that person to this. And also, the party that is supposed to look at a person's good character traits and personal attributes, which include honesty, integrity, selflessness, competence, and merit. The party invariably, in the Nigerian context, regrettably, decisions all this. So the issue of somebody becoming a member of the political party, and understanding what the party stands for, what its values and orientations are, do not feature in the way, or even its loyalty to the party, do not feature in the ways in which they are recruited for elected positions. What matters is who is the godfather or whether he has money, and, uh, or whether there is a, a, a money bag that supports him or her. And obviously this creates very serious challenges because personal conduct, personal character traits, and personal attributes are not into consideration. And because regrettably, those who select Candidates through political parties do not pay attention to this. You know, invariably, voters also, when they come to exercise their power to select uh, and to vote for this uh, provided candidates, uh, also do not factor this uh, uh, in their selection processes. And therefore, we look at the current Nigerian uh, situation. Frankly, it's a very, very sorry situation. We have a lot of work to do in order to reposition Nigeria back to the trajectory of liberal democratic uh, uh, rule on the basic principles and tenets if we want to, in a reasonable period of time, be considered as a mature democracy or a full democracy in the community of nations. Now, obviously, Nigeria's current situation, when we look at it and review it carefully, is that not only is Nigeria classified as a hybrid regime, which means it is neither fully democratic nor fully authoritarian, and it's a mixture of the two, and one in fact pulling in opposite directions. That is why I said initially that it's falling, it's not moving, because authoritarian uh, uh, values and practices which have been legacies of the very long period of military rule, about 32 years or so, to all come to them together of military rule, uh, obviously means that that authoritarian disposition is there. And in fact, the values and the orientations of ordinary citizens are remarkably constrained by this disposition. If you ask who are our national heroes or who are our leaders, most of our young men and women, if they have any heroes at all outside of celebrities in the media, they probably are former military leaders. And it's a very, very serious challenge. So our political parties, our candidates, in fact, many of the people who acquired positions uh, during the initial elections of transition to democracy in 1999, uh, who controlled political party processes, who contested for elections, or won elections, uh, were what some of us are beginning to call politicians. 
either they have learned the politics and the military transition to democracy, or they were actually retired military officers uh, who had entered politics and have become dominant in the political process. So obviously, rather than helping to build civic culture, they have more or less continued to entrench an authoritarian culture in the so-called transition to democracy. So therefore, as you try to democratize, there are these formidable legacies of authoritarian rule that are also pulling you up. Because the mindset and the mentality of the dominant elite in political parties and in governance is actually undemocratic. And you cannot win democracy without democrats. You know, if those driving a democratic process are basically people who have an undemocratic mindset, then obviously you are already on faulty ground. And that is a major challenge that confronts Nigeria's democratic development. So I say that uh, uh, Apart from the fact that we are a hybrid regime, Nigeria is also increasingly being referred to as a fail of failing states. Because in, 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 in social theory, political theory, the state has a responsibility. And the state has a responsibility whether it is under an authoritarian or under a democratic regime. And that responsibility is key to national stability, national prosperity, and the satisfaction of the needs and the aspirations of the citizens. That's why, for example, in some contexts, people will say that a democratic regime uh, can also be benevolent. How can a democratic regime be benevolent? Maybe when the uh, 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 dictator, the authoritarian rulers uh, are still oppressive, uh, are still uh, 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 controlling, you know, uh, uh, people, but at least they are performing in certain aspects related to the normal basic functions of a state. And what are these basic functions of a state? There are about 10 of them, but I can mention just a few. First and foremost, security of life property. It's a major obligation of a state under any discrimination. The state must protect lives and properties of citizens. And that is why the state has the monopoly of legitimate use of force. Using the police, using the army, using all sorts of security agencies in order to protect lives and property. In particular, this legitimate use of force is also to help the state in actualizing the second important function of the state, which is the protection and defense of the territorial integrity of the country. So these are very, very important issues. You protect the citizens from foreign attack, and then you also protect their lives and their property. And that is why the state the power to use force, whether through the military or through the police or other security agencies. The third important function of the state relates to adjudication. We mentioned about the significant uh, principle of every citizen is equal before the law. So if every citizen is equal before the law, then obviously there has to be an independent, neutral, process of adjudication, okay, and also of uh, 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 ensuring that just, justice is done under these circumstances, whether under criminal or under civil uh, uh, litigations. So it's very, very important, uh, 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 at least these are key and uh, important issues. Of course, regulation of uh, civic life as well as regulation of uh, uh, the market, because market is a big component of any state. You know, how do you regulate private conduct you know, in the market sphere? These are important functions of the state. 
So it's, it's in the Nigerian context when you look at this, people are saying that, that some people are saying Nigeria is actually a failed state. Because if you look at all of these critical functions of the state, you can hardly find one where you can give a strong map for Nigeria, you know, in terms of actually describing that function. And some are saying, okay, well, if you say it's a failed state, then it means that really uh, 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 there will be chaos, there will be anarchy, because then the state is not doing anything. So some people are a bit more circumspect, and then they say, no, Nigeria is not a failed state, but Nigeria is a failing state. So, saying it is a failing state means that you can still prevent it from failing. Which means that citizens have obligation to participate in the democratic process and to ensure that people of integrity come to preside over the governance process in order to ensure that the state is rescued from itself and that it goes back to discharging its own obligations and responsibilities and it goes back to satisfying the fundamental needs and aspirations of citizens. So it, unfortunately, when you look at all the major global indices which are being used to run countries and to compare countries in terms of who is better, Nigeria ranks very, very low. Starting from the uh, uh, gross national product to the uh, even the uh, 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 gross national product per capita, GDP per capita, and then when you move to that, uh, which is about economic growth, not about the distribution of wealth, but it is economic growth, you find that there are very very similar things. The economy is faltering. In fact, the economy is also for people here in one nation going abroad. Look at the heavy debt burden. You have to take uh, uh, loans to pay even salaries, not to talk of building infrastructure or to provide uh, uh, security. So, so these are fundamental crises, which means that really like a serious challenge that is uh, 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 failing, you know, but it is not too late for citizens to recognize this and to get their act together and to get involved in order to really prevent the situation in which the country could be run aground. So I have provided in this paper, I think there is no time to go over it, uh, a table which provides the ranking of Nigeria on many of these global indices, which is really uh, uh, appalling. Of course, from what we normally read in the newspaper about the corruption perception index, there is even what is called a censorship index. The way and the manner in which the regime censors media and freedom of expression. You know? And there is even a democracy index. You know? There is even a governance index, the more we are in governance index, that rates countries in Africa about the level of uh, efficiency and the effectiveness of governance in terms of addressing the needs and aspirations of the people. Nigeria not ranks lowly using all of these. Uh, indices. There are so many other indices, the Fragile State Index, the Gender Gap Index, the Human Freedom Index, the Human Development Index, the Physical Quality of Life Index, the Religious Freedom Index, and there is even now what is called the Insecurity Index, where countries are compared in terms of the extent to which uh, they have handled issues related to insecurity or higher incidences of violence. Uh, um, all of these, uh, I have a table here which when you get into the Nigeria runs in the world. So, really, in Nigeria there are very serious challenges, and Nigeria, I, I agree, I do not think Nigeria has a state as God forbid, and we have to work hard for the fact that it is in the But everything points to the fact that the state is failing. And the state is failing because of the way in which leaders have been selected by political parties to go into the governance process. 
they are not manifestos that are seriously believed in and that are also implemented when the party gets into power. So there is no discernible effort at interest aggregation beyond self-serving objectives. Hence, when, when one closely examines the so-called dominant parties, there are uh, no substantive ideological orientations for each of these parties, and there is certainly no discernible ideological differences distinguishing one from the other. For example, who can tell what really differentiates APC from PDP? I know there are many members of APC and PDP and many other parties here, but let's be honest with ourselves, what is the difference? Hmm. You know, it's the same people who will get together, money for convenience, try to access power and the resources that control of power gives them, and when they quarrel among each other in terms of accessing the resources, you know, and uh, marginalization in the process of governance, then they exit, and then they go and make other uh, 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 marriages of convenience, and then they compete, you know, and they are so shameless that they have no shame in terms of, again, when this one does not want, they also go back. <laughs>